Welcome everyone to our first virtual event by the McGill Society of Montreal. Um, with, and it's called Gardening on Your Balcony During the Pandemic with Dr. Carolyn Begg. So Polly, like many of you, I have a small space and I'm looking forward to figuring out how to make the most use of my balcony and to learn some gardening tips from an expert. So thank you so much, Dr. Begg, for joining us tonight. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to say a few words about the McGill Society of Montreal. So my name is Julie Dunstigian. I'm the current president of the MSN. And I'm here with Micheline Ayoub, who is a director on the board as well. And she's put together this event for tonight. So thanks as well, Micheline. And um, so I just want to explain a little bit about the McGill Society of Montreal. We're a group of volunteers. And we all come from various backgrounds and done different degrees or diplomas with McGill. And we have a keen interest to try and look for new events uh, and also exclusive events to bring the McGill alumni located in Montreal closer to McGill. So thanks again for all turning out tonight. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about us and follow us and learn of any future events that we uh, hold, uh, please look us up on our Facebook page and I'll include the link in the chat. Uh, and then if you follow us, you'll be able to keep up to date with uh, any news from us, any news uh, from McGill, and uh, stay informed of any, update, uh, any updates for, from us uh, event-wise. And also uh, to make sure that you're also staying up to date on future events related to the McGill Bicentennial celebrations, uh, please check that your contact details are up to date with the McGill uh, alumni website. I'll include those details also in the chat. And that way you'll be also be receiving any news from McGill related to the uh, bicentennial uh, events that are coming up. Um, also, one more thing, I'd like to thank all those that's contributed to the uh, Student Emergency Fund. Uh, we did collect some money from that and every little bit helps. So thanks so much for doing that as well. Uh, so on that note, uh, Micheline, I'll hand it over to you and you could introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Julie. So welcome everybody. My name is Micheline Ayoub. I had put this together. However, I cannot help with the technical difficulties that some people had with registration. This is due to the platform that was put to, the, to this event, uh, to, to this end uh, for this event. Uh, now I would like with the McGill Society of Montreal, to welcome Dr. Caroline Begg. Caroline is a faculty lecturer in the Department of Plant Science at McDonald campus, and she will share her knowledge about growing your own food and producing beautiful flowers with specific tips for those with balconies. Aside from her teaching, Dr. Begg is the director of stage for the Farm Management and Technology Program. She is also the mentor to two McDonald campus clubs the McDonald's student-run ecological garden and the farm to school program, along with being president of the Marché saint -Anne, a growing farmer's market located in saint -Anne de Bellevue. She also serves on the board of Corbeil de Pain, a food security organization in the West Island. Dr. Beck, please, if you would like to share your slides with us, the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity. It's early in the season, so everybody has a chance to plan a little bit. So this is, uh, this is good. So I'll share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, I'm gonna go, right, sorry, presentation mode. Here we are. Okay, so I'm going to just delete that. Okay, so, um, so basically it's container gardening and what to do if you only have a small space. Uh, uh, I'll answer some questions as uh, I, I have breaks for questions, but um, the main thing is, is that um, I, I mean, I have um, just to say that I have uh, two garden plots uh, in, wow, well, it's probably, huh. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, I have two garden plots in, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm in the two community gardens um, and I have a big flower garden outside my place here and I grow a lot of things in pots just because my plots, my vegetable plots are a little bit further away 
and I like to have things uh, right beside me. So I hope, I uh, just wanna see if, um, oh, I don't, I guess, yeah, if, if there's any problem uh, with any of the presentation, somebody will have to call out and let me know because I can't really see anybody. Anyways, um, so I had grow a lot of things in containers and for me, it's a, it's a standard thing. Uh, just to give you an idea, last year I grew kale, coriander or cilantro, uh, spinach, lettuce, basil. I had window boxes with carrots. I had um, I had I had some leftover transplants, so I put them in some pots. So I had some hot peppers. Um, what else did I have? I had more than that. Uh, spinach. Yeah, I think I said spinach. So I grow a tremendous amount of things in in containers. Uh, I find it very easy to do, and I like the proximity. So, and I'm on the north side of a house uh, where my, actually my garden is. And um, so they, it doesn't get a lot of sun. So I'm looking at maybe, you know, maybe four hours a day, something like that. So it does better with the um, uh, sort of leaf things. So anyways, so why continue your garden? Because you can basically do it in almost any location. Um, it's good for people with disabilities uh, or mobility problems. You can put the containers, uh, as you see here at the bottom, up on tables or things. Um, if you're on the balcony, it can be up on top of things. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, it can be low cost, low input. You can recycle just about any containers uh, that you find. They can be plastic. They can be ceramic. They can be... Uh, uh, that you can use these fiber bags. These uh, I have these for my dahlias outside. Uh, there's these. They're sort of like fiber, um, and they've been sitting outside now for four, or five years now, and it's still they're still fine. Um, it's fairly easy to be successful, um, and I don't do a lot of maintenance, so um, everything kind of grows. Uh, you can start things sooner in the spring because the soil can warm up much faster. It can be easier to control pests in a container garden. So my main problem where I am are squirrels and maybe raccoons, maybe skunks, I don't know, but definitely squirrels. And so squirrels persistently, like I've stopped growing tomatoes here because uh, I had to fence them off and keep the, those things out of my tomatoes. They'd come in and just take a bite and then leave it. So it was such a problem. But uh, I use sort of like a sort of a chicken wire, like loose netting on top, and uh, that worked out quite well. But if you're on a balcony, you usually don't have a problem, so that's very good. And it's also useful in areas. So if you have areas around your house where it's either it's it can be difficult, there's either rocks or roots, or if you're concerned about the soil itself or it's toxic, then uh, you may want to just grow in containers. And I, again, as I said. One person posted a question, and I might just answer it right now, about the soil. I reuse my soil. I don't throw it away. I will dump it out from my big pots if I can, and I'll add a bit of compost because all I want to do is loosen it. So my dahlias have been growing in the same soil for, I think, four, four years. This will be the fifth year, I think. Um, I just loosen it up. I add a quality compost because usually quality composts have a lot of good beneficial microorganisms and they take care of any pathogens. I don't really have any problem. So um, I, don't, I don't dump my soil out. I keep my soil. Um, and I just add some additional compost and I loosen it up because usually that's the problem at the end of the year, it gets compacted. And so I just loosen it in this coming spring. So uh, that works out quite well. Um, any container works. You can make uh, arrangements. You can you, know, you can set things up. I have, I have a number of pictures here just to show you the variety of things. The big key thing with a container garden, and I'm going to come to this a bit later on, is drainage holes. You have to be able to allow the water to drain out. I'm going to show you the problem with um, if you don't have drainage holes, what happens with that. So that's the key thing. So here, this basket, old basket, lots of holes, you can line it with paper and put the soil in and the plants will do fine. Same thing here, as long as there's holes, any container will work. Um, so a wide variety of plants do really well in containers. There's a couple of just a key things you have to make sure that I have, 
coming up uh, sort of um, um, sizes of pots to use for certain things. But the key things is just make sure that, it's, that you water it well, that you give it fertilizer because the soil that you use, uh, potting soil doesn't contain much fertilizer at all or nutrients, and as long as it has some sun. But basically you can grow everything. I've grown, I have grown in containers, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, oh, I have eggplant twice there, or aubergine. Um, uh, I've grown peas and beans in containers. I've grown all of these here. Ra well, I don't eat, like radishes, but you can grow all of these here uh, in containers. Something that's really nice to consider is basil. Basil does supremely well from seed. You can grow that, it's just like 100% or almost germination. Um, and if you go onto some of the sites, there's a, a large number of varieties of basil. One of the key sites that I go to is Richter's. Um, I can type it in the chat later on. Uh, from uh, north of Toronto, uh, they're um, kind of a medicinal herb, but they have a huge number of different types of basils. And basil adds a lovely scent. So if you're concerned about, if you like to have a scent, if you're sitting out in your balcony, uh, you brush basil and it's just uh, beautiful. Uh, but you can have basil, it can be obviously eaten, but parsley, summer savory, arugula, coriander can all be started from seed. Um, the other thing too is don't hesitate in the larger pots to mix in plants, uh, sorry, flowers. You can do that as well. And as I said, I use window boxes for growing some short carrots, uh, beans and peas. So you can have direct decorative uh, containers or practical. Uh, they, they can be window boxes or you can get these bags. Uh, they, they have window bags that sort of hang on the balcony. Um, I always turn my window boxes in. I'm always worried a bit sometimes when if they're on the outside edge of the window that they might fall off and hit somebody. So uh, mine are always turned in, but depends how confident you are in your window boxes. Uh, but they do have these sort of fiber bags that work extremely well. Uh, again, I thought this was a really cute little picture here. Uh, if you have old clogs that you don't like anymore, uh, great place to grow flowers. Again, lots of aeration lots of drainage holes and uh, plants do very well in these things. Uh, again, some more containers, uh, old wheelbarrows that might have rested out at the bottom. They serve very well, you can, you can plant in them. Here they just cut, cut a dry, uh, kind of a barrel in half. Uh, here they've used uh, just old plastic containers and as long as they've got drainage holes on the bottom, again, not a problem. And here, this is excellent, this is good sun. Uh, so size, um, it does depend on what you want to grow and it should be large enough to support uh, fully grown plants. Uh, I have some definitions of sizes coming up. One thing you should avoid containers uh, with narrow openings. So if you're trying to fill something up with soil and it has a really small opening, then that's a bit of a problem. Drainage is cri critical. I'm going to keep mentioning this because um, I've lost some plants here because the drainage holes at the bottom of these pots uh, plugged and uh, water was left standing in the pot. And that's the worst thing for plants. Um, what you have to remember is that roots breathe. They actually need oxygen. And if your soil is constantly saturated, then they will die and your plant dies. And that's probably, um, more plants probably die from overwatering or, or very poor drainage than dying from um, uh, be, having too little water. Usually it's overwatering and it's a pot that doesn't have proper drainage. The other thing is uh, your container should never have held toxic products. So you don't want to have anything that's leaching from the container back into the soil and possibly into your plant. Uh, terracotta pots, I really like terracotta pots, but I do agree that they dry out um, quite quickly because the, the, the clay itself will allow water to leave and they do uh, evaporate fairly quickly. However, uh, the soil stays fairly just warm and not hot, so that's a good thing. Ceramic pots, now the problem with ceramic pots is that they're often used as, you can put them on the outside and maybe have a terracotta pot uh, on the inside because many of the ceramic pots don't have drainage holes. And if they don't have drainage holes, don't use the pot. Um, Things just don't go, grow well. And I will answer this question coming up about 
can I put stones in the bottom of the pot and that will help with drainage? No, it doesn't. And I'm going to show you why it doesn't. Um, you can choose rot resistant woods, but don't, don't choose any wood that's in creosote treated. Um, that's very toxic and I don't think it's really allowed anymore, but there is some still around. Uh, just to note that uh, wood is very, very expensive right now. And we're having a bit of a problem with Corbet de Pan because we have, um, uh, we build, we, we do uh, community gardens or, or collective gardens for some of uh, the people we work with and uh, the wood has become extremely expensive. Uh, some of the cheap plastic can deteriorate in the sun due to UV. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful. Um, sometimes by the end of the season, you'll notice that there's cracks in your pots and, and that's pretty much it. And to remember that black pots will absorb heat when they're sitting in the sun. So that's another thing. The roots don't really like to get extremely hot. If you do have black pots, then just make sure that they are watered uh, just so that the water can moderate the temperature and uh, keep it cooler. Um, okay, so drainage. All containers need drainage holes to let the excess water out. This is, you can see here, nice roots uh, all at the bottom here. And you can see here, this is where it's been too wet and you can see all the roots have died. And this, this, whatever was here is, is where well, you can see the dead leaves here. So it's already dead. It's not gonna recover. Most plants will not recover from overwatering. Uh, they will probably recover from drought, but they're much less likely to recover from overwatering. And it's really overwatering. And what I wanna say, it's overwatering with poor drainage. Um, if the water uh, comes out at the bottom, then that's great, it's not a problem. But if it's sitting in the soil, then this is a big problem. Um, again, plant roots need oxygen. They need to be able to breathe. So they need porosity in the soil, like pore spaces, air spaces, so that the water can, drain, can flow in, but then you get air spaces so that the roots themselves can breathe. The smaller the container, the more frequent the watering. Um, but it does depend a bit on the plant, but most, let's say vegetables, annual flowers, they, they need water. Because you have to remember that in, in the situation we have now, um, all the plants have a much, much restricted root growth. And you can see here with this one here, it started to wrap itself around the entire pot. And so it's looking for nutrients, it's looking for water. And so they can't grow deep, so you need to water them. But if it's saturated, then the, the roots will, draw, uh, will die. So that's a big problem. Um, yeah, so small pots restrict the root area and they tend to dry out very quickly. Um, the size and number of plants to be grown determine the size of the container used. And one thing that you should remember, which I never remember, okay? So I have a big problem when I plant my garden I always, you know, I put my tomatoes in or I put my uh, peppers in, my aubergine, everything. And I look around and think, oh, wow, there's lots of space here. So I put in a, some more tomatoes and I put in some more peppers because these are the things I like to eat. And um, I'll throw in a couple of kales, different places. And I always, always, always forget that the plants get much, much bigger. And then certain things get shaded out and some things don't do so well because the tomatoes usually take over. So remember that uh, when you do plant, when you do put your plants in, if you start from seed, you can thin, you can remove these some of the plants. But if you use transplants, do remember that um, they do get much bigger. And so uh, you may want to plan, and I'll show you a bit later, about how to arrange some of the plants so that you use the space to the best of your ability. Uh, deep rooted vegetables require deep pots. Another thing you should be concerned about, um, you can use, you know, use sometimes smaller pots, but if you do get wind on your balcony or if you get wind, if you have, if you put some things outside in a certain area, you may consider, um, tying them up or, or making sure that they're not going to fall over because of the wind. Because one of the things is, is that once that potting soil dries out and there's a strong wind, they can easily be blown over, especially if the plant is very big. 
So tying them to the railing, um, uh, tying them to a fence, depending, uh, that's usually what I have to do here just because of the winds that we get. Uh, I always have things sort of tied down because uh, it, they do fall over. Um, you can make sure that your pot has adequate drainage. You can line the base of your pot to prevent uh, soil loss. Uh, you can set your containers and bricks or blocks to allow free drainage. Um, yeah, so if you choose clay pots, just remember it's porous and water is lost from the sides. And you should support your uh, climbing vegetables with trellises, stakes, nettings, or twine. Uh, if you grow peas, peas actually, or sweet peas, that's another thing. You could grow sweet peas, which have a lovely scent. Um, you can have them wind up to the uh, roof of the balcony um, just to create sort of some shade if you want or a different sort of environment. Um, sweet peas are lovely, but remember that sweet peas are not edible, um, but they do have a lovely scent and they're very attractive. Uh, so again, different containers, uh, you can make areas look very attractive. Um, Geraniums are really useful. Uh, you can, they're usually pretty cheap to buy and they grow and they do very well. They're very hardy. And a lot of, some of them do have scents, so that's also a very nice thing. Um, old bicycles work, uh, different things like that. Um, again, here, a variety of pots and containers. But again, you can see here's the ceramic and they put the clay pot inside because the ceramic doesn't have, um, doesn't have any holes. So uh, just make sure that whatever you're growing, and so they've got some things here like tomatoes and quite a small pot, which is possible. Um, there are some, if you go to some places, they will actually sell now uh, peppers, tomatoes. Um, yeah, those are the main ones as bush or patio uh, plants. And that means they're, they're small enough to put in um, pots. And you can also grow um, uh, summer squash. Summer squash actually does quite well in pots as well. I've grown it uh, in containers as well. Um, yeah, and so here a whole variety of herbs, uh, which are very nice. And a lot of these are very easy to grow. As I said, basil is, is extremely easy. Um, but you can also buy these transplants at most um, so sort of garden outlets, whether Canadian Tire or um, uh, Provigo or Walmart or anywhere, and you can get fairly decent plant, uh, transplants for not very much, and uh, they will last you for the entire season. And I think, yeah, so I have a break for questions. So um, I'm going to stop sharing right now and just see uh, if there's any uh, questions. Um, we have received a lot of questions. You had started talking about the um, uh, the the uh, if the balcony is facing east or north or south before everybody came on. Would you like to comment on that, Caroline, please? Yeah. So the thing is, is that um, if you have a balcony that's facing south and east, that's probably the boat the best direction to. Um, uh, for plants, most most vegetable plants require lots of sun. Um, they generally, but there, I mean, there are it's sort of seasonal. So your, your lettuce prefers cooler temperatures, your spinach prefers cooler temperatures, but they like the sun. But you can also, if you have a large container, which I'll show you in a bit later, you could put your tomato plant in the middle and then you could plant lettuce around the outside edge. And so the lettuce you could harvest early and the tomato could continue to grow. Um, for your north facing, uh, th that's just more problematic. Uh, it's, you're better off with leaf vegetables. It's harder to grow the tomato and pepper. You might be able to, but you might have to kind of, um, you can also get rollers. The other thing is you can get rollers, um, uh, sort of um, bases for your plants, your larger plants that are on rollers. And so you can roll it. If your balcony kind of the sun moves, you can roll your plant back and forth like through the sun. So that might help. Um, you, should get a, you should have at least four hours of sunlight if you're gonna grow tomatoes and peppers, maybe preferably five. Uh, but if you don't have that, you can still try, but I just, you might then try and grow cherry tomatoes. That's probably your best bet there. Uh, yeah, so that's my 
east west yeah but i grow on the north side of my house so it it, it does work uh, there is uh, also a few questions about the pots, the potting. Uh, do you need to have holes in the pot? Can you line the pot with mulch or can you line it with textile? Um, and uh, if you could put stones or rocks in the pot. No, I'm going to come to the stone yeah. and rock thing. Okay, I'm going to, I have good diagrams on that. But what I strongly, I don't actually put anything in the bottom now. I don't, like I, I'm going to have to say I was brought up with the principle that you put stones in the bottom of the pot or you cover the hole at the bottom of the pot with a with a clay shard and that's all wrong. Um, and I learned the hard way. But anyways, it, and I can show you why it doesn't work. Uh, but all I do is I sometimes just line it with a bit of newspaper uh, just to keep the uh, soil in. And don't forget the soil will eventually just co become coherent, uh, cohesive, sorry, and it won't fall out from the bottom. So mulch, mulch on the top, but not mulch in the bottom. Okay, uh, I'll move on to a question. I'm trying to group the questions by topic. Uh, we had a lot of questions about, can you grow watermelons or zucchini or- uh, Watermelons, I doubt. Uh, so, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Michelle, yeah, I'm sorry. There, there is a question about blueberries. Um, what fruits can be grown in the containers? So if you could comment mm -hmm. on, in general, what could grow on the balcony? Okay, I, I would recommend um, mainly annuals, okay? Uh, I don't recommend, the thing is, is that, okay, so the thing is, is that you're, if you're growing perennials in pots, what happens is that they're not in the soil. So that pot is going to freeze, fully and it may kill the roots. Most of the time when we have the soil, we think the entire soil is frozen with like outside, but it's not. It's probably only frozen maybe five centimeters down or something like this. And most of the other roots are doing fine. But when you have a pot, a pot will freeze solid and basically it will kill the plant. So perennials, Further south, yes, I don't. There's no problem, but not here. I wouldn't recommend that at all. I don't have any recommendation for fruits in pots unless they can be kept heated, and that's not really possible. But watermelon or pumpkin, no, because they're just too big. They just require too much space. However, I have grown zucchini, and there is a bush zucchini that does quite well. There's a patty pan, a few others that are smaller, and they work perfectly fine. Cucumbers, I just saw that. Cucumbers, yes, grow quite well in containers. You just need a trellis. Um, okay, so somebody, yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. Any anything else? Uh, that's it about uh, top top like what you could grow. Uh, would you like to go back to the slides or sure? I go on? I'll, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I have another stop uh, uh, coming okay. up. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll gather my thoughts. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to go back down to here. Okay, let me see. Okay, so, okay, soil. So uh, there was a question about soil, about um, replacing soil. One thing is I do not use garden soil. I mean, regular soil from the garden. Uh, the main problem is like, again, I'm going to go back. I'm really saying this over and over, over again, but um, soil from the garden will compact because you're tending to water it always from the top. And so when you pour the water on the top, the, the soil compacts, it gets lower in the pot and it, there's a problem. Um, because what happens is that the porosity is lost. You don't have air entering the pot. You don't have oxygen entering the pot and the roots then die and then you know, endless problems. Plus the garden soil also increases the risk of insect infestations or soil borne diseases. So you don't wanna do that. So I always use potting soil. Um, generally you can mix some compost. I believe it's about a quarter compost to three quarters uh, potting soil if you want. Many of the potting soils come with compost. Uh, you can get various things. Um, so uh, I like to have it so that, because uh, the potting soil is very spongy, it maintains its structure, it doesn't uh, compact very much. I mean, it does a bit, but not a lot. 
Um, but it doesn't hold as much water as garden soil. So you do, again, have to remember to water. Uh, and what you can do is you, if you leave about uh, five centimeters to two inches from the top, you, from the, the soil in the top of the container, you can put mulch on the surface, which is very useful. I wouldn't use wood mulch. I would use maybe something else, maybe a straw or leaf or something else. Um, but you could use, well, no, I don't, I don't think I would use wood. Okay, anyways, um, th because then when you pour the water on, it doesn't sort of compress the soil, it hits the mulch layer first. So you can do that. Um, now, do I replace my soil? No, I don't. Um, I simply dump it out um, for part of it. I loosen it up because it's usually had, you know, it's been, as I said, I've been watering from the top, so it's constantly compacting. So in the springtime, I dump it out if I can, or, or, or I take it out with my hands. I mix some compost in, and I loosen it up, and I try and make sure that I get down to the bottom so that my drainage areas are, are loosened out. But I've been keeping it for, for years, and I don't change it. So um, yeah, I, mainly because I don't like lugging around bags of soil, so uh, I try to keep reusing it as much as possible. Um, so. Again, you just buy a decent comp, uh, potting soil because you're basically providing your plants with a medium to grow in, and then you're going to add the nutrients. So it doesn't have to be, uh, it just has to be nice and loose uh, for, the, for the plants. Uh, so here is just showing some mixing. So here, this is a cucumber growing in pots. You don't really need something as big as this. Again, uh, I've grown them in smaller pots. Um, but the, again, the only thing I have to emphasize is that anything that's really tall, like this one here. Okay, so here, this tomato plant here. Um, it's quite tall. It's got lovely cherry tomatoes on it. But if it dries out, this thing is really susceptible to wind. So you do have to make sure that it is tied so it's not going to fall over. This one is fine. Uh, this is a tomato plant here that's just going over here. So... Um, any pot works, uh, size, it doesn't have to be that big, it can be smaller, uh, but uh, just be careful that they don't fall over. Um, the other thing is, is that you can put uh, lettuce or something else down around the bottom here um, and uh, that will grow. It doesn't require as lettuce, uh, lettuce, um, uh, spinach, these sort of sorts of things don't require as much sun, so um, they can do, do well in the shade. Um, so you can plant many different things together in the container, but the ones that you know that are going to be growing really tall in the center and everything else around the outside edge. Um, yeah, so, so you can mix plants together and also, okay, uh, I have, um, one of the things that they've found now that's been coming out is a lot of research being done on this, that most plants do much better if you mix different, different, um, plant species together. So instead of planting two tomato plants together, plant basil around your tomato plants. So there's been some sort of synergy between basil and tomato. And what they found is that the soil microbiome that is there really does well with a diversity of plants. There's some sort of synergy between the microbes. And so this is very beneficial, but there's competition between the microbes if it's the same species, the same plant. So mix and match your plants, that's the best thing to do. Um, and I have some uh, coming up, so a chart of compatibility. Um, the other thing too, don't, don't be afraid to cut things back. Um, just gonna go back to the basil here. Basil, you should always keep clipping because it keeps throwing out um, new shoots at the nodes. So always keep taking off the top growth and you'll always have constant new growth. Uh, tomatoes, um, you can remove the suckers, I don't bother, but uh, some people do, um, you can do that. Uh, so don't be afraid to cut them back, many of them will regrow. Um, you can you know, make sure that you don't have something that really needs a lot of sun and something that really needs a lot of shade. This is usually more of a problem in the middle of the summer. Uh, most of the vegetables, this is more dealing with um, with flowers, uh, especially if you're growing succulents and annual flowers, that's more of a problem. Um, but uh, with most of the vegetables, they almost all have the same water requirement. 
uh, it's not so much an issue. The other thing too, here's a really key um, point. If you have a really big container, you've decided you're gonna do this big container. Um, I would recommend if you can get these bases that have roll, uh, uh, rollers on the bottom, that's very useful to be able to move it around. But if you don't have that, then make sure that you decide where you're gonna put that container before you fill it up. Don't try and move it after it's filled up. So uh, that's, um, sometimes we always forget about that. So put it where you want and then fill it up in that spot. Okay, so drainage. Drainage is key. And rocks in the bottom of a large pot add weight and generally do not work. I know that you want these pots to be heavy so that they don't fall over, but I find it's much better just to tie up the plants and not worry about it. So I'm gonna show you some diagrams in a minute, but rocks at the bottom of a pot will cause a wet layer above the rock. So I'm gonna show you this uh, a diagram. And this means that the roots have a restricted rooting volume. Roots will not grow, well, not, of, not the plants that we're growing, they will not grow into saturated soil. So if the soil is completely wet with no air, they won't grow into that. So um, you, uh, the holes should be at least an inch, half an inch wide, if not more. Uh, preferably use newspaper just to cover the bottom, but don't cover with pot shards because it creates a, a big uh, sort of hole and water doesn't pass there. So what happens here, if you put, what you've got here um, is the, this soil here, I'm gonna look at this one here. This soil here has relatively small pore spaces. And the thing is, is that this soil can hang on to water quite well. So the water moves down through here and it reaches this layer here of really large pores. And basically what you want to think about, think if you can think of a dripping tap. And if you look at the water that's dripping, you notice that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then finally drips down into the big pore space. And it's because of the adhesion to the soil above here and the cohesion of the water itself. There's very strong forces that are holding the water here and it just, it will only drip into this, these large pores here. So whether or not you have a layer of gravel or you've covered it with a big shard here, so there's a big hole, water doesn't like to move into large spaces like that because of the cohesiveness and adhesiveness. So what you've done here, if you put gravel, this is basically, no, it's not wet, it's completely dry. The, 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 this area above is saturated so the roots won't grow in. And so you only have half the volume where the roots can actually grow. Where if you have um, just paper at the bottom here, this is always going to be a little bit wet because it's gonna take some time because you've got big holes here. So it takes time for the water to let go and the roots can keep sucking it up from the top here but you've got much greater volume of soil that the plants can actually occupy. And that's critical for, uh, you, you're growing things in pots, so you don't want to cut the volume in half. So again here, what happens is if you're watering from the top, the water comes down and you have this sort of what they call perched water table, just because it doesn't, just because these holes are really big. And as I said, this adhesion and cohesion here, the water doesn't want to flow out but water will move back up from this wet layer by capillary action. And you, if you water, if you've ever had house plants and you water from the bottom, you can see the water will be sucked up into the pot and this is due to capillary action. But if you've got stones here, just going back, stones, if you put stones in the bottom here, water is never sucked back up by capillary action. The pore spaces are too big and the effect of gravity is too strong, so water is never, can never rise up through these large pores, but it can through the small pores of your potting medium. So really important, don't use stones, don't cover your, the bottom of the hole, and this is for house plants as well. Um, don't, don't put the, a shard on top of the hole or don't put stones there. Um, the water just does not flow properly. And uh, then you just, you reduce the volume that the, the plant roots can occupy. And this is what causes a lot of death among plant, uh, with plants. So um, 
going on about watering, I'm going to come to fertilizing a little bit later. Uh, don't underwater. Uh, most of the time, I've never found a problem. As long as there's drainage, uh, I usually water every day. Uh, it does take time, but um, it's, it needs to be done. The other thing too is that water will cool the soil. So that's good for the roots because they don't like hot temperatures. Um, and just remember that container plants, there's more extremes because um, they, they have a very the small volume of soil to moderate temperature. So if it's windy or if there's really a lot of sun, then you need to water. Uh, if you have mulch on top of that soil though, you can reduce uh, evaporative loss. So that's important. You could use compost as a mulch, straw, grass clippings. I hesitate about shredded bark just because sometimes there can cause a few problems with uh, nitrogen mobilization. Um, uh, leaf mold are good mulches. And if you can, something like Lee Valley does set up a set, uh, have uh, drip irrigation systems that you can use, but uh, you can just water. Um, you, if you do over water, which I've never had, may happen more with house plants and certain plants, uh, flowers like succulents, um, they're very sensitive to too much watering. I don't have very good luck sometimes with succulents um, because they, yeah, anyways. Uh, I, I have a harder time to tell with water. Now, how to tell if your plant needs water? Um, the thing is, is that you can never tell, uh, it, it's, there is, there's never really a schedule about watering. What, I mean, if you see that the plant leaves are wilting, then obviously it needs watering. Otherwise, you put your hand in the soil and you, if you take a bit of soil out, if you squeeze it and it sticks together, then, then it's still moist. But if it feels really dry, then it's time to water. You, you sort of use your fingers as uh, sensors to figure out whether it needs water. And that's the best thing. Um, but again, I'm going to say that this works for annual flowers, uh, annual vegetables, for perennials uh, in houseplants. It's quite a bit different. It really depends on the plant itself. Um, if they're cacti, succulents, um, Orchids, these sorts of things, they require different types of watering, and I'm, I'm not really going to go, go into that. Um, but generally, for me, in the summertime, sometimes it's twice a day, depending on how hot and dry it is. So just to show you here, what happens is, is that if the soil is too dry, so the thing is, I, you know, I have said that overwatering is worse. But in the summertime, if you, good, if you do have a soil, uh, sorry, a pot with good drainage, and you have a big plant like tomatoes. The thing is that when the soil is dries out, it creates this airspace. The soil shrinks away from the from the uh, root, and for nutrients to reach the root, they actually have to travel through the water. And this dark area here is the water. And if they if this is dry, then uh, nutrients are not reaching the roots, and then the plant suffers and doesn't uh, grow as well. And especially. If you do grow tomatoes, try and make sure that um, you are doing uh, regular watering because tomatoes have this tendency to grow uh, too fast. Um, and sometimes if you do irregular watering, then the skin doesn't grow as fast and then you get cracking and some problems. But just to show here that this is where um, it's dried out too much, the root is having problems connecting with the uh, water films, and this is the only place where nutrients actually move in the water films to get to the root surfaces. So those are, that's key. Um, so nutrient needs. Um, ponding mixes have very few nutrients, so you really do have to fertilize. Um, you know, start small uh, when the plants are small, but then uh, follow the directions on the container, uh, the, the, the nutrients, um, sorry, the fertilizer. Um, personally, I prefer uh, low, uh, low analysis um, uh, liquid fertilizers. Uh, you can get some that are pretty well organic. Um, I like to have a relatively even balance of nutrients. Uh, interestingly enough, if you're growing uh, vegetables, you actually need um, more potassium than you do nitrogen. If you're growing leaf, like lettuce, kale, et cetera, then you need more nitrogen. Um, but uh, I don't like to use anything like 20, 20, 20 or 15, 15, 15. 
it's, it's, there's too many nutrients there. So uh, I'd like to go a little bit lower, like um, 862 or something just not, not as high as that. Um, yeah, so here, it, I'm sorry, I missed this here, about the, 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 how moist the soil is. You, would, you, know, you can put a popsicle stick into the soil. If the, the soil sticks to your finger or the pop, popsicle stick, then uh, water isn't needed. If it doesn't, then you need to water. But just note that why we fertilize so often with uh, container pots is every time you water, most of the nutrients can be washed out into the bottom of the container. So that's why we tend to fertilize fairly frequently. It's usually about every two weeks, um, sometimes more with uh, fertilizers. Um, yeah, so nitrogen is for leaves. So if you're growing tomatoes, try not, uh, fish emulsion is not the best because uh, there's too much in there. Uh, P and K are needed for fruit and stems. So um, that's important. Um, yeah, so uh, you can start dilute in the very beginning and then build up. Uh, fish emulsion is 511, which means 5% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, 1% potassium. That's kind of not the best of balances. Uh, you need sometimes a little bit, you need more potassium for your tomatoes. So just showing you here uh, for, com for compost, you should quarter compost to three quarters of the potting soil if you wanna mix that in. Uh, in any fertilizer, whether it's inorganic or organic, it's always written as the first one is always nitrogen, the second one is always plant available phosphorus, and the third one is always potassium. So something like 846 is 8% nit nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, 6% potassium. And there's a lot of good liquid fertilizers now in the stores, some very interesting ones. A lot of them have organic uh, based um, nutrients. Um, so I find that they work very well. Um, and I think uh, I prefer liquid over solid. I use compost, but I will prefer liquid uh, fertilizer over solid. And these nutrients are all immediately available to the plant. Um, so uh, sun, vegetables need full sun. So six hours, preferably. Uh, sometimes it's, they say it's, over, it's easy to overestimate how much sun there really is. So you should time how long things are there. Don't forget, you can mix flowers and vegetables together. There is not, nasturtium is a really good flower, uh, edible flower. Um, calendula is another one. Um, I don't know all my edible flowers, but nasturtium is a beautiful plant. Um, you can get many different things, but the flowers are edible. Uh, and diverse plant mixes pr promote better root growth and they're always definitely prettier to look at. So I'll take another break for questions and then there's just a few slides before the end. So uh, I'll stop sharing. So okay. I, was, I was I was compiling uh, compiling the questions somehow to put them all together in um, in one theme. Uh, there is a question about what goes together. You just mentioned that flowers and uh, vegetables can grow grow together. Do you have examples of what could be growing together side by side or in the same pot or uh... um, the like nasturtium is uh, if you uh, I, I am sorry I don't know my Latin names of plants I'm actually more of a soil scientist than I'm a plant scientist so Latin names are just I don't know nasturtiums are uh, that you, you can get these ones they have red um, red or yellow or uh, they call them variegated I can't remember the names of them but they're beautiful plant beautiful flowers and they cascade so they cascade down the plant so they can actually fall over and so they cover up the pot, which is really nice. Uh, they do well, um, they're not, they, they get big, but usually towards the end of the summer. And so they grow well with, uh, you can also get transplants of marigolds. Uh, they're fine, marigolds growing from seed are difficult. Um, uh, so marigolds, you can get transplants of marigolds. Uh, Cosmos uh, also work. You can get the short ones. You don't really want to get the full tall ones because they do become, they will become quite competitive. Uh, but the small ones work. Uh, they're, they're only about uh, 20 centimeters tall. I think they're very short. Um, what's, oh, what's marigold? Oh, geraniums. I don't know that I would mix geraniums. Geraniums, I probably would keep separate, but you, geraniums? I don't know. Yes, you could probably could put geraniums in. They're, the flowering geraniums is not a problem. Um, 
sweet peas, uh, those are great. Um, what's the other? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of different flowers, but I mean, don't forget some of the herbs do really well, like the basils, uh, they're, they can go the flower. Uh, they're excellent as well. Uh, shall we move on to the next question or, or topic, I would say? Uh, how do you deter squirrels, groundhogs, the cats of the neighbors from eating your plants? Uh, Whenever they start growing, they get eaten. Yeah, so the squirrels, the only thing that I, okay, the only thing that I don't know, okay, so the back community garden, we have a big problem with rabbits, groundhogs. I don't know what, everything, like but we have a colony of rabbits now um, there. They're eating all the lettuce, all the beans. Uh, the only thing you can do if you're in the garden, uh, in the ground level, let's say, then you're going to have to use um, four uh, rabbits and four groundhogs. You have to put uh, a net up. You have to put chicken wire, like small chicken wire. That's the only thing that's going to keep them out. Squirrels will climb. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem there. But squirrels don't eat my lettuce. They don't, they, they, they taste things which are problematic. Uh, what I find deters squirrels though is uh, blood meal. Blood meal is um, literally blood meal. It's, uh, it is 1200, it's high in nitrogen, but it smells, it doesn't smell nice. And that seems to really deter squirrels because it smells like dead things. And so uh, that works at deterring squirrels. I use it because I have tulips, and if I don't use it, I don't have tulips. Um, but um, the rest is, it's uh, for me, for everything else, I've had to put up uh, like sort of netting around my things to keep the squirrels away. Yeah, that's all I know. I've tried chili and it doesn't seem to turn to mind. So <laughs> uh, cucumber bugs, if you know how to get rid of them. And, oh, cucumber uh, bugs. People are, are asking what is eating the cucumber leaves and squash leaves. Yeah, that's the uh, cucumber beetle. Um, uh, the only thing you can do is there's something you can buy that's called row covers and you can look for it either at Lee Valley or um, I don't know if I've seen it in sort of like, uh, like, the garden section of some of the like, Canadian tire, but row covers are like a very fine white fabric. It's very, very light, extremely light. And you just drape it. I use it in my garden uh, on my um, squashes, on my uh, cucumbers, um, sometimes on my kale, and it prevents uh, insects. It's just a barrier against the insects. And once though the cucumbers and the uh, squashes and the and the kale have gotten big enough, then the cucumber beetle is not a problem. But it, there's nothing that will kill cucumber. I don't have I don't use sprays, so I don't know. But everybody I know uses the row covers. So you, if you type it, Lee Valley has them. Yeah. Yeah, Sean is asking when you add the blood meal, isn't that too much nitrogen for the plant you're adding it around? Uh, I haven't found it being a big problem. I agree it creates an imbalance, but I have so much mulch on the top of my soil, like so much leaf from last semester, uh, last semester, last uh, fall, that it helps with the decomposition of the leaves. So I'm usually not too worried, but I agree it's not the best of things, but it's kind of like the, this, there's no choice. Uh, yeah, I don't know about wolf urine. Um, Question about, oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say the basil, I, the one thing about the basil, why it doesn't last the season, you're probably not fertilizing it that much. It's the only herb that I know that requires a large amount of fertilizer. I, I fertilize it like I would fertilize lettuce, uh, a lot of my other vegetables. Uh, I won't fertilize lavender, um, la sorry, lavender, uh, sage, um, tarragon, uh, I'm missing one, some of the others. Or, or oregano or thyme. I don't fertilize those, but I do fertilize my basil regularly every two weeks, and then it lasts the entire season. Uh, um, I, so, I was. Go ahead. Mission? Well, if you're in, anyways. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm looking at my question because I was taking notes. Uh, Somebody is asking a question about a jasmine plant in a container. Would it grow or can it face in cell? Jasmine plant. 
Um, I have, um, you can't really see it behind me. I have a, yeah, I have a, I have, um, what is it called? I can't remember the name of it. It's sort of a jasmine, it flowers in the, in the late fall. It's a tree really, and it's doing okay. It's not particularly happy, but it does, uh, it does, it does flower and does, does bloom. It, it really depends. Uh, the other, you know, just something that's a really strong perennial and has lots of roots, you know, you really do need to pot it, you know, maybe every three years or something like that. But don't forget, every time you put it into a bigger pot, it gets bigger. So, you know, sometimes it's better just to trim the roots and put it back in the same pot if you don't want to keep, because at some point you're not going to be able to move it. <laughs> so. Anyways, I have a few more slides. Uh, I'll go back and finish off. Okay. There was a question also about that. Did you bring them inside? Uh, sorry, bring what? Sorry. For the winter? Bring what inside? Dahlia roots. Oh, the yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dahlias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bring the dahlias in. I mean, they are cheap enough, I guess, to uh, rebuy, but I, hesit I hesitate to throw them out. If you have so them, I just have, have them. So what I do is I, I, I uh, take them up in the fall once I've, I've had a hard frost and they're dead. And then uh, I let them dry. And then I just get uh, two boxes and I just put vermiculite on top and I uh, water them every once in a while to keep them moist so that the roots don't dry out. And these, this will be my third year with this set of, uh, of daily roots. Okay, then yeah. thank you, Caroline. You want to go ahead with the rest of the Yeah, session? I'll finish uh, off. Yeah, so share screen. Okay. Okay, there's not too much left, I think. Let's, okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah, there's not too much left. So just, this is, this is was from Edible McGill. Um, and it's just showing the diversity of what you can grow in containers. I mean, they have a special setup for watering, but you don't really need that. But here's the uh, Swiss chard mixed with tomato. Oh, there's, don't forget dill, dill is excellent. Uh, here they do have marigolds. Uh, you know, the climbing beans, excellent, excellent choice. Um, don't forget you can use, you know, the ceiling of your balcony for, for putting the beans up and climbing. Um, here they have, I think it looks like, well, I don't know what that is. Uh, but there's j just about everything will grow in containers. Um, and here is just showing uh, crops and companions, like things do well together. So like if you, if you decide to grow cucumber, then putting bush beans is, works very well. They're companion pl uh, plants. Um, with the cabbage family, um, you can use, so that's uh, you know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale. You can use any of these, these ones here, they grow well together. So this is just showing some of the possibilities of mixing things together. Uh, nasturtium, there's how you spell nasturtium. Uh, excellent, this is a beautiful flower. Um, oh, and don't forget you can use many of these things in hanging pots, that also works very well. Uh, they will drape down and they're very nice. So, uh, but this just shows, shows some possibilities of mixing and matching uh, things together. Um, and here, this is squash growing in a container. Uh, and here's the squash here, though I'm going to have to say, I think this one has had probably a little bit too much nitrogen. Uh, again, don't forget that um, if you have a plant that you want to have a fruit off of and you add a lot of nitrogen, you're going to get a lot of leaves. So you have to be careful about how much uh, nitrogen you're adding. But it is producing fruit, so that's a good thing. Uh, here is um, chamomile. Chamomile is a very nice flower to have as well, plus it's a medicinal. Uh, excellent one. Uh, okay, sizes. Okay, so just to note, sometimes they sell pots as gallons, but one thing that I actually just found out is that a gallon, a nursery gallon, is not the same as a regular gallon. So uh, a gallon in the nursery trade is only 0.71 of a regular gallon. And here's the metric sort of uh, number of liters. So um, here's just some sort of idea of like one gallon here. Uh, this is the dimensions. And this is what you can grow in a one, one to two gallon pot, a three to five gallon pot, five to 10, <clears throat> uh, six to 10. Six, six, well, this is a six to 10 inch pot, sorry. Um, 
tomatoes can be grown in dwarf tomatoes can be definitely grown in smaller pots. Uh, it's really just about making sure that these ones here just make sure that they have enough water, have enough nutrients, um, and you know you can grow them in maybe in seven seven gallon pots. They don't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be huge. Uh, but then it depends also again how much squash you really want to eat over the summer. So that's one thing. So but it was just interesting to note that a nursery gallon is not the same as a standard gallon that we uh, normally think about. And here is just showing here uh, pot sizes and what they're suggesting could fit in. But then you could put in a tomato and you can put uh, flowers, basil, lettuce around the tomato. Uh, with the carrots and beets, it's all about depth. It's all about the rooting zone. So that's why you need the sort of shallower uh, or smaller scale carrots and beets. Um, and the bigger ones for these ones here, but they will do well in smaller pots. It doesn't have to be huge. Uh, but here you can put three plants in a 24 inch, but I preferentially would put one tomato plant and mix other things in uh, with it. Uh, again, here, um, marigolds. So yes, marigolds, basil, and here are the tomatoes growing up here on the side. Um, and just showing uh, different ways of putting things together as containers. Uh, there's so many things around. If you look around the house, what's possible? Uh, again, here they're using pails. Uh, sometimes people throw out a lot of these pails and just put some holes in them and you've got uh, a container garden. My squash never looks this big in the garden. Um, and here they're growing peppers and beans here. Um, and this looks kind of terrible, but this is definitely at the end of the season. This, this is when I grew hot peppers in the window box. I did grow tomatoes, but the squirrels got most of them. Uh, but the hot peppers, they didn't get the hot peppers. And I, these things yielded so many hot peppers. Uh, just, and this was just a small window box. And I had, again, I over put too many plants in. I think there were four plants in here. And uh, they produce a huge amount of hot peppers. So I think uh, that's pretty much it. Um, the basically, you just have to fertil water, fertilizer, and sun, and um, it always works. So uh, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Caroline. We still have a few more questions to ask you, if you do not mind. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, somebody asked uh, earlier on, what are deep rooted veggies? Did you mean carrots and beets? Yes, the, the, yeah, the, I, the, I did grow last year potatoes in a container um, and it did interestingly work, but I think I put too many potatoes, like I would I, anyways, I think I had them too dense, but I'm gonna try it again this year. And I'm gonna try not to put so many in, but it did work. But th that you need a big container. You need because you need to put them in, and add soil, and then they grow. And you add more soil, and then they grow. So it really only works, I think, if you have an area outside to do it on. Uh, but I was talking specifically about about well, radishes can grow very in very shallow soil, but uh, uh, carrots and beets will work because you can get the smaller ones. You don't have to go for the really big ones. You can get the smaller varieties, and they don't grow as deep. Um, sorry, I had a typo there. Uh, another question that was about clipping basil. Do you have any tips about how to clip basil properly? Oh, just pinch it off at the top. Because the thing is, is that it's, it's apical, apical dominant. So as long as you allow it to continue to grow, it dominates the plant. Hi, everyone. This is Julie Dunstigian, the president of McGill Society of Montreal. I really hope you enjoyed this event. Unfortunately, there was a small technical glitch with the recording and some of the questions were cut off towards the end. But in any case, I really hope you took away a few new ideas from this presentation. And we want to thank you for joining us. And we also wanted to thank Dr. Carolyn Begg again for pulling together this really great presentation. So to stay informed of our future events, please do feel free to follow us on our Facebook page, the McGill Society of Montreal. And if you had any suggestions of any future events you'd like us to look into doing, please don't hesitate to drop us a message. So again, on behalf of the McGill Society of Montreal, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you.